the screen recording. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm going to, to run these steps locally, but um, first, um, yeah, actually, let's get this, this workshop formally started, so <laughs> welcome. Uh, it's, it's wor well, 20 minutes into workshop, um, having some, some technical logistical issues. That's kind of expected. It, it happens in a lot of workshops, but um, yeah. I think that, that that's the the boring part that we uh, that we had so far, and hopefully the rest is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I think I mean personally, uh, the thing that excites me the most about Elasticsearch is that for me and for all the people that I've worked with who use Elasticsearch, this is the one thing that they say: this is fun. Um, and so I think this is the the one thing that I want to to share today. So I want to share well th that it is fun. Can I give you an idea how it works? Uh, we're going to see a few of the APIs that Elasticsearch provides, uh, but there's a lot more. I mean, if you if you if you look at the book, um, it's there's a lot of things in there, a lot of really cool stuff. A good part of it you will need only in special cases, um, but there is a lot. It's all very well documented. The website is is great. If you have any questions, look on Stack Overflow. You will get tons of answers. Um, so this is. Um, what I want to, to give you today is an introduction, a brief overview. Uh, we're not going to, going to cover everything, um, but um, yeah, so that's that's what we want to do today. Um, and uh, also, one one thing that's important: uh, the code that I have here, the the starting point, it's meant to be focused on Elasticsearch and so we're putting the code all in one place so that we know where like the, so that it's uh, it's not an introduction to Drupal 8 development and Elasticsearch and Composer and everything um, so the code is not necessarily well structured in a way that we would do a professional project there's a lot of exceptions that are not handled uh, there's a lot of things that are yeah that could really be improved but this is not the focus so don't go back and see, uh, say, uh, hey, uh, I, I saw this in the workshop. I'm going to do this in, uh, in production. Um, so the idea is to really get familiar with Elasticsearch and with the API. It's not necessary. Uh, the code I'm sharing here is not, uh, is not meant to be used in project necessarily. Um, and also the, some of the requirements that we're going to have, some of them make sense, could be like a real situation. Some of them they're kind of made up, and um, yeah. So that's don't don't try to to analyze and to put too much sense into this. Um, and so if you want to get an idea of what we're gonna uh, be doing, well, actually, if you open the the local Drupal installation that you have, um, you have something that looks like that, but without all the content here. Um, so this is a, a small Angular Angular application uh, that is already installed. Um, and so we're not going to be working on that, but we're going to uh, index the data to create this kind of recipe search engine. Um, and we're going to provide that data to the front end. So if you go to that page, the search is not going to do anything because you don't have any content. Um, so what we're going to do now, um, I'm going to just go quickly through the steps to just run every, run all the components that we have in our system just give you a quick overview, and then we're going to put some data in there, okay? And if anybody has any questions, uh, just raise your hand, let me know, and uh, we'll look at this. So what I have locally, I already did a, a site install, but I'm just going to do it again, just so that we're all on, on the same uh, page. Oh, Ellen, I'm getting the same error that, uh, that you did before. Great. Um, I think this is a, this is a permission issues. Probably don't need the pseudo. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was the, the uh, permissions issue on the settings of PHP. Settings. 
Drupal is sometimes kind of helpful in that it's like, hey, let me make that file read only. Um, so I'm going to copy the password for the admin user and uh, just run Drush run server. So now I have this running on port uh, 8888 locally, and I can just open that. Um, yeah. And if I want to log in, I can do that. Oh, that's the wrong password. Just going to reset the password, and we are good to go. Address ULI uh, user reset link or something like that. It, it sent like it sends you the same link that you would get in a reset password email. Okay, so we are now in our site, and now we have this front end. Um, so first step, as I mentioned, we want to get data in there. If we look at our <laughs> at our uh, repository. We have a datasets folder that has a, a recipes.json file. Uh, it's, it's kind of JSON. Uh, it's not really JSON. It's not valid JSON, unfortunately. Um, and that's just a format that this open recipe database came in. Um, and what we have is that we have um, a custom module in web modules custom called recipe search. This is the, the main module that we'll be working with, and this is where we'll be writing code. And in there, there's a Drush command that has been implemented called import recipe. So here we have the definition that we want to have a Drush command, and there we have the actual code that gets executed. So the, what we're going to do for this workshop, we're actually going to be working directly with the uh, the PHP package for Elasticsearch. Uh, so this is a composer package. If you look at the composer file, you will see it's downloaded explicitly there. And we're just going to instantiate it. We're going to uh, use this client builder, build from config, and where we have this hard coded. So this is one of the things that usually you would not just put your configuration there in the code. You would have some, that somewhere, uh, well, in your configuration. Um, but what we're doing here is that we're just connecting to Elasticsearch on port 9200 on localhost. Um, so this is um, just like the same way that you connect to any kind of database, you specify uh, how you connect to that. And um, the same way that, that MySQL, for example, has databases and tables, there is some kind of equivalent, and don't take this too literally, um, in Elasticsearch that we have indices, and inside of indices we have types. So what we're going to have is we're going to have one index called recipes and a type called recipe in there. That's kind of just however we want to name that. Um, and before we do anything, before we import anything, we want to make sure that we have a clean slate so we're going to try to delete the index. And so if you, if you see here, actually I'm going to put, go back in um, presentation mode. There. So we have our Elasticsearch client. We have this indices uh, method, which actually just is a, a shortcut, a, a way to group all the, the methods that have to do with index modifications. We try to delete the index uh, with the name that we specified. And here you see um, we have some just uh, an array as, uh, as the parameter. If you look at the, this method here, um, it actually ha it lets you know what keys will be valid ones. Um, so this is quite well documented. And actually, f both for the um, both for the PHP um, the, the, the PHP client, as well as, for example, the JavaScript client, uh, these, uh, these clients are really thin wrappers around 
the, the, the standards REST API. So actually, most of the things that, um, well, most of the API that you will be seeing will not be made specifically for the PHP client or for the JavaScript client or for the Java client. It will actually uh, be a thin wrapper around, uh, around the standard API. Um, so here, what we try to do, we try to remove that index, and actually, if it's if it's not there, which will be the case for pretty much all of you, uh, then that's okay. We just want it to not be there. Then a little bit later, we have some things that we can skip, and what we're going to do is now we have a, a special a special function that pretty much imports all the JSON data. Cleans it, cleans it up a little bit. It does, it does some nasty stuff, uh, data wrangling and stuff like that. We don't need to care about that, but what we get is um, individual recipes. And here comes our first tax, uh, task. We need, to, um, we need to put that in the index. So here we have a cl uh, our client. We call the index method on it. And here we need to put the parameters. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. The, the, so uh, the, this code is actually well. You would need to put it, package it differently inside of Drupal Seven, but it could actually work just the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, what we want to do, and uh, if, if we take a look at this recipe, it's going to be uh, an uh, well, not an object. It's going to be an array, but that doesn't actually re matter really. Um, so, do you want to give it a try? Should we do this together? Okay. <clears throat> so, the, um, if we take a look at these, uh, the parameters for this, we see that there's a lot of in, uh, a lot of parameters that we can give, um, but there's only a few that are required. We need to specify the index, and we need to specify the type. So, where do we want to index this document? Uh, we can also specify an ID, although that's that's optional. If we don't specify one, Elasticsearch <laughs> will just give it one. Um, and also, we need to specify, well, what is it that we're going to index? Okay, so let's use that. So we're going to um, put the uh, body, uh, no, the index, and previously we defined a variable uh, with our index name, so that's, that's index name. The type is going to be type name, ID. I think we also have an ID. Yeah, we do have an ID uh, variable. And of course, that's the important part. We need to specify what data do we want. Um, uh, that's the path to the file is going to be. Um, it's the path to the file is going to be web modules custom recipe search and then recipe search dot trash dot ink. Okay, and so for the body here, um, this is the part where we can actually put anything uh, that we want, or almost anything. Um, and so we have a recipe object, and so what we're going to do, we're just going to submit that recipe object. Um, and this is the great thing about, uh, well, one of the great things about Elasticsearch is that uh, it will actually take any structure that you give it, um, and this doesn't need to only be like a, a flat structure. It could actually be an object with arrays in it and arrays of objects and things like that. And whatever you throw at it, it will actually take it as is. And, and most importantly, it will also return it as is. So for example, if you, if you work with solar before, um, it's, it's always a, big of a, a bit of a hassle to have to serialize your data, to put it in solar, and then when you get it out, get a totally different structure than what you are using in the rest of the application. Uh, so this is really nice uh, that we have this. We can just send objects 
the way they came in. Um, and actually, that's that's it. So we're going to go to our terminal, uh, and this is something that I would recommend. Um, so just open multiple tabs. One of them will be running um, just Drush Run Server. We have <coughs> another one that uh, where we're going to be working in, and also well. You probably have this uh, running already. Um, yeah, so one with Elasticsearch and one with Kibana. Uh, what? Okay. So so you, if you go to the project root and just yeah. execute dot elastic search uh, dot slash elastic search slash bin slash elastic search. Ah, okay. Oh. okay. My, uh, so uh, uh, what what we have here? So if you open uh, localhost on port nine two zero zero, this is the standard port for elastic search. You will have something like this. The name will be different because every time you start Elasticsearch, unless you specify a name for your node, it will pick something from a, a Marvel characters. It's always kind of fun to see what comes up. Um, yeah, and then Kibana, you will probably see something like this. We'll get back to this in a little bit. Um, okay, so now we are in our web directory and we're going to run the recipe import. Okay, so drush uh, import minus recipes. I have some error here from xdebug. You can ignore that. And so it's going to just go through all the recipes and just import all of them. And we have, I think, 170,000 um, recipes. And since all the um, all the APIs from uh, from Elasticsearch are uh, JSON-based uh, REST's endpoints, um, we can actually access this directly um, from the browser. This is sometimes quite practical for debugging, or you can just use curl or whatever. Um, and there, uh, so we have our recipes index, and if we want to search in there, we can do that. And we see at the moment I have 59,000 that are in there. Um, it's, and it's returning the first 10. And we see the data that we have in there. So we have a name, we have ingredients that are actually um, as a big, um, big list. I, I think there are some new lines in here. Um, also a URL. Um, we actually sometimes have an image, but for most of the, the data set, we don't have any images, um, and some other other fields. Yes?
I think we, we noticed one issue in there uh, in the the path to the, the JSON file is relative, so you need to be in the web folder and not deeper in there. So this uh, body, and then you pass it the, the recipe out there. Recipe out there. Hmm? I increased the number of recipes to 1,000 also, and mm -hmm. I increased the memory limit to 1 giga. Oh, for, the, for PHP? Yes. And I, it's I, I actually, if, if as long as it imports something, if it stops along the way, you will have less recipes, but that's, yeah. It, how, I, how many are there? Uh, 170,000. Actually, we can, if, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm? The reinforce, what happens if you re uh, re index it just overrides? If it, so, uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. If you if you re index, if, as long as you use the same ID, then it's going to just uh, replace that document. Um, if you, yeah, or what our script does is before import, re importing, it actually deletes everything. And after the index stopped, we switched. Yeah. Because uh, the index was last in the number of products, for example, or recipes or um, or yeah, yeah. available on the website. Yeah, there there's definitely some very interesting strategies to to like have like no no downtime uh, upgrades and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what was the index? Uh, it was uh, drush import minus recipes. Okay. Hmm? Are, are you in the web directory? Okay. And do you have do you have um, Um, do you have uh, the uh, recipes.json in your data sets? Yeah. Hmm? I also have a small one. Okay. Uh, do you know why Trosh doesn't see my environment as a running? Do you have any idea? It just won't. Oh, that's Trosh being a. Hmm. Yeah. It doesn't see it as a running environment, but then if you. Give it a status. It sees the database driver yeah. and everything, so it seems to be okay. But it's just, hmm. I, I've seen this issue like on a regular occasion uh, with Rush. That's and so if you do the so that's weird. Okay, because um, also. Uh, Drush run server doesn't run, of course, because of this. Mm -hmm. So basically, I run it on my own server, which mm -hmm. is probably okay. Yeah. But this, do you know? Maybe if I can run Drush commands from the web, <laughs> it should be possible. Mm, well, no, the the problem is that this this will need a lot of memory, and it's it's going like uh, the, I could go to to. Uh, run PHP code from the bottom and run the function from there. Yeah, I guess that could, could also work. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, so who has who has data in their index? Okay, <laughs> some people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Hmm, actually, the latest one from. Yeah. I, I'm using 1.8 uh, or like the, the current latest. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if you, yeah. I googled it and they said uh, you should install one. Yeah, but the, that's yeah from 2013. So um, that's no, yeah. I try, I try with the latest Java version. I think that that should work. Yes. Okay, so for for all the people who have it working already, uh, there is an optional task, and you're kind of on your own for for this. Uh, but you can modify the code. Well, at the moment, it takes uh, on my machine it takes 138 seconds, uh, so well over two minutes to like to import all of that. And actually, the reason it's it takes that long is because PHP is quite slow. Mm -hmm. Elasticsearch can handle much more data than that uh, at much faster speed. Uh, the reason is that we're we're really s sending the individual documents once at a time, yeah. and so. If you want to use the bulk API, uh, there's a command for that, and you can just send 1,000 recipes at a time, and it will go like many, many times faster. Okay. Can I help anyone? So what, what you have there uh, is actually the kind of the, the welcome page, um, okay. and what we can do is with this slash recipes. So, so there it gives you information about the, the index itself. And now if you go, if you add uh, slash uh, underscore search, you will actually do a search on that. And how do you get uh, Nice. So, um, yes. So to, to get a, th this is a common question. If you want to get a, a nice view of your of your JSON, um, there I would recommend installing a browser plugin that does that. Um, uh, th this is quite standard. Also, if for all the the Elasticsearch commands, you can also add a query parameter called pretty. Uh, so question mark pretty, yeah. and it will it will display things in a much nicer way. Yeah, 
Yes, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. And here we had to increase PHP model. I don't know whether it's one to 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 one to
So uh, now we want to say, hey, uh, this is our index. This is the one we care about. We're going to uncheck index contains time-based event. And we're going to just put recipes. And it recognizes that this index exists and it like, the button becomes green. Yeah. And so we're going to create, well, it's actually going to, hey, uh, we're going to define the index that we already have, like make it known to Kibana. And there we see we have all our different fields, description, source, and so on, some additional data. Um, so it seems like we have everything. And now if we go to the Discover tab, um, actually I'm going to zoom out a little bit so this way we have the full interface, we see pretty much like it gives you, it gives us an overview of what data we have in there. And so this is actually a very practical debugging tool. You can see, hey, um, so that's, that's what my data looks like. Uh, we can also specify individual uh, fields that we want to have. I only want to have uh, the name and the URL to the recipe. Stuff like that. So th this is actually quite nice. Uh, and, 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 sorry? I, I clicked on discover. Oh, and for selecting the fields, yeah, just on the side here. So that's, that's all great. Um, um, but now we want to understand that data, not only see it. And um, I mean, it, scrolling very for a long time, uh, that, that would not be very helpful. So we're going to click on the Visualize tab. Um, and we can see, for example, um, well, we're going to create a vertical bar chart. Um, and what I would like to do is see how this data evolved over time. Uh, so we see now we have one bar that says how, how much stuff we have and we're going to create and on the x-axis we're going to date, add a date histogram uh, facet or aggregation and by the, when was the content published. And we're going to take a look at it on a monthly basis. And there we see, hey, this is actually the, state, the data comes from like started around 2004, 2006, but really not that much data. And then somewhere ar around 2009, uh, something big happened. And then there was, so it looks like here's a lot of things were imported at once. So um, this is, yeah, this gives us an idea. And we can dig deeper, add one more bucket of type uh, terms. And there we can do that on the source field. The source field specifies where the data comes from. Um, and so when we do that, um, we see that we actually have, it, it shows us the, like the, the data, the information split by all the different sources. Um, and yeah, th this is great, but we notice that we have an issue um, because the source is actually, uh, well, Chow or BBC Food or, or well, now it's all BBC Food, but, um, and there's more, um, but it's actually taking the individual words instead of taking the values. And the reason for that is that when Elasticsearch imports texts, it treats it as text and the standard analyzation will just split all the words. And when we create an aggregation um, to, <coughs> or when we, we try to do anything really with that field, then it's going to treat the individual tokens uh, as values and not necessarily um, the text as a whole. And so what we need to tell Elasticsearch is we need to say this field, uh, the value that's in there, th like, BBC food, it's not two separate things. It is, BBC food is one thing. Uh, or bon appetit is one one thing. Um, and so we, we really need to, we, yeah, we, we need to tell Elasticsearch a little bit more about our data. So by default, it just takes everything and like the way it is, that's actually great. It's 
makes for very quick development, but very often you want to specify, hey, this is what my data is structured, uh, how my data is structured. Um, and to do that, we're going to move back to uh, a little bit up in our file where there's the task number two, where we want to expli explicitly set the schema. Um, there's a link about the, 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 the uh, to the, the file, and I see that it's actually already 11.30, um, so I, I think we're going to move a little bit faster. Um, we're going to cheat here. We're going to go to um, the solutions branch, and we're going to take a look at that file. Um, so that in modules, custom recipe search, recipe search.trash.inc, and here we have actually a big block, and I'm, I'm just going to copy all of that and then uh, go through it. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a hint uh, there that we can we can see how the um, how our data is structured. So recipes like underscore mapping, we see what what we have. So cooking time is a string. Uh, date published is a date, and so on. Um, and we're going to uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to create the index before just sending data into it. So we indices create. We specify the index name, and then in the body we have um, two separate parts. I guess we can hide this this one for now. We specify the mappings. And for our type, we're going to specify what properties are there, are expected, and how they should be interpreted. So for example, the, the specific case of our source, we're going to say, yes, it is a string, that's correct, but it should not be analyzed. So we're going to just take it as a value and not try to split it into words or figure, like do any stemming or, or, or anything like that. Um, same thing for preparation time or total time or recipe category. Also the URL, we don't want to do, like to split that into words. So th this is actually one of the mo most common things um, to specify fields that should not be analyzed. In the upcoming uh, Elasticsearch version, this is something that's treated differently. So now it's not the default anymore. Um, but for, for a while, it's going to, it's going to be like that. So we specify how these should be analyzed, and um, Elasticsearch also provides a good amount of, like, very good uh, default. Um, for example, the English analyzer, or there's also analyzer for a lot of other languages. So for the name, the descriptions, and the instructions, we can actually specify this is in English, and we will automatically have proper stemming and um, the apostrophes at the end of the word, things that are, things like that that are um, noticed uh, or like detected properly. Um, so we're going to specify those. Um, yeah, and the ingredients will come back to that. And um, and actually the the settings here we're we're just going to skip those. Um, and so now if I re-import. My recipes, it's the same one. Um, and so, uh, the, the schema I copied it from the, the solutions um, branch on, on, on the repository. And so now if I update my mapping, I see that um, where is the source here? It's not analyzed, and so on. Also, a very common one um, in this case, the dates are in a ISO times uh, ISO uh, format, and that gets uh, detected automatically. Very often, when you import data from Drupal, you will have timestamps that are integers, and then Elasticsearch will just import that as an integer and will not know that it's a date. And so, you need to specify that it's a date and that you actually expect. Uh, epoch seconds. Um, by, def by default, Elasticsearch works with milliseconds for timestamps, so you need to make sure that you tell it 
what kind of data you have. And so now we, we are re-importing the data, and if we update our visualization, now we have something that actually makes sense. We have the names that are treated as full entities, full tokens, and not split into pieces. Um, so, if you um, so you uh, select a bucket type, and then for the first one, you took a date histogram on uh, the dates published field on a on a monthly basis. And actually, if we do it on a weekly basis, it's going to be more data, but it still works fine. And then for the split bars, then we do. Um, we do that on the source field. And actually, we can do that with a little bit more. And so you can see that actually, even with a lot of data, uh, we still get a very fast response. Um, and yeah. Um, actually, the, the, the one good way to crash Kibana is to put something that, like, data like this on a, an hourly basis instead of monthly basis, and then the browser will crash, not, not the backend. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Mm-hmm. By, de by default, it, unless explicitly specified, it will split. It will use a standard analyzer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so now we're, we, we have our updated data. Um, and we see that everything is um, part correctly. So now if you open your Drupal site, uh, you will have actually uh, the data, access to the data. And so if you search for bacon, you will have a lot of bacon recipe. You can even look for bacon and chocolate, and you still get lots of recipes. Um, I haven't tried that bacon chocolate bruschetta, but uh, it's. I, I kind of feel like I, I have to try it at some point. Um, yeah. So, what is happening here? Um, so, what we're doing, um, we have a controller that has been defined. Um, if you look at the routing file, it's under API slash search, and it's using this recipe uh, recipe search API controller. Nothing to do with the search API, uh, so recipe search API control. And in there, we have one method called search. Um, actually, if we take a look at what's uh, our bacon vanilla. Oh, there's also stuff with bacon and vanilla. Um, for now, we can adjust, uh, ignore the suggest requests, and so the the, the search uh, endpoint delivers um, the data that, that we want to have. The way it does this is that uh, so we we get the, our input data from the request. Uh, this is the data structure that we want to have kind of documented, and then we build a query. In this query, we specify what index do we want to search on. And again, we have the body in there. There's kind of a, a nested structure. And this is actually one of the, the trickier parts of Elasticsearch, is like getting familiar with this uh, JSON structures that you use for making requests. What we're doing here is that we're doing a query, so a search query, uh, using a match uh, query, so it's going to look for specific words, and 
what the match query does, it looks for words and also calculates the the relevancy. Um, so it's going it's not it's not just a filter that says is the word there or not. It's going to look for the words and um, actually by default it does an or search. So it will look at everything that has bacon or chocolate. Um, and there might be things that have both bacon and chocolate, but it will like also look at where the data is, how often does it happen, um, and how how significant um, is that uh, are the individual individual word. Um, and so, for in this case, it like without specifying anything, it actually does a very good job at uh, finding things where like. For example, everything is in the title because it notices the title is a shorter field and so it's probably more relevant than just the body which is very long. And so if somewhere in the body it mentions bacon and somewhere else uh, chocolate, then that's not going to be as relevant. So by default it is actually do it has some default logic that in many cases works quite well. Um, so, and what we're doing, we're searching on a specific field called underscore all, and we're, this is the input that we're specifying. We could also say we only want to search on the name, or we only want to search in the ingredients, but in this case, uh, we want to just search everywhere. Um, this is something that on real projects you will probably want to specify, I want to search exactly on this field, or exactly on this one. Um, and you can even have like search with a multi-match query, search on multiple fields and give them different weights. So that's the searching part. And then what we also have these facets here that show us, well, how is the data distributed? And here we have this AGS or aggregations uh, section of the, our, our request. Um, and here it's important to know, to like real, uh, see the difference between uh, JSON uh, structures that are actually identifying just a name, like something that's free, freely defined, and also uh, defining things that are actually a reference to a specific command or plugin for uh, for Elasticsearch. So here we are specifying a sources aggregation. This is just what I'm calling this. This is because, like the source of the recipe, um, I could call it something else that would be fine. And this same identifier will be reused in my res in the response. And here, um, the sources aggregation is going to be using the terms. And a terms aggregation is actually just, like it's the most standard kind of uh, facet, so to say. Um, and well, aggregations are a little bit more powerful than just facets, but uh, I think everybody's familiar with the word facet. Uh, what it's doing, it's looking what are the most popular terms um, for these um, um, uh, for the for the results um, in these specific fields. And so I'm going to look in the sources uh, source field and pick the most specific, uh, the most relevant terms. I could also say, well, I want to sort those alphabetically or however, and what I'm doing later on, I'm putting, um, well, I'm executing the query, so I'm passing my query to the search method, and then with the response, I'm just going to just go over it and uh, put the results in my data in in my response, and also add the values from uh, the aggregation. And so, there we have. This is how uh, we get these facets here. The problem is that if we do that, well, it doesn't really do anything um, at the moment. The reason is that we're getting the, we're generating the values for a facet, but we're not doing anything when the value for the the, the value comes in. And this is actually task number uh, three. We're going to cheat again, um, if that's okay. <laughs> and in there. Um, um, 
So this is actually going to do uh, 3 and 4. So what we're doing is that, well, we, we actually want to have multiple things that we want to combine. We want to search things that are both uh, that have to do with bacon and chocolate and that are from all recipes or from like a list of, uh, of specific sources. So what we're doing is that we're using a bool query. So instead, we still have this match query that we had before, but now we're, uh, we're structuring this, we're putting this under a Boolean query. And a Boolean query takes, uh, has multiple sections. One of them is the must section. So all the things that need to be met. Um, so first it needs to match what we entered. So it needs to have bacon and chocolate or one or of the two. Um, and then later on, what we do is if we have uh, a source that has been select, selected um, or actually an, or an ingredient, so this is a better example, um, then we will actually add to, um, we will extend the query, we will add another, uh, another item under our must section, and there we will say, well, it needs to have the term uh, in, in well, the field ingredients needs to have the term uh, whatever we selected. Same thing for uh, the sources. Although for the sources, uh, we have the problem that if we did this exactly the same way, when we select something, then we all the other facets would disappear um, because it's only select it's only returning the aggregations for what's in our data set. So what we're doing instead is we're using uh, a post filter, which means that it's not like the um, the facets will not be affected. Uh, well, yeah, the the facets will not be affected uh, by uh, by this filter, um, and so that means that when I select tasty, oh no. When I select Tasty Kitchen, all the other recipe, uh, all the other facets are still displayed, um, and I, I have the possibility to say, well, I want this one and this one. And yeah, and the the other thing that we did there, um, so now we have um, this these ingredients. Uh, this ingredients uh, facets, but if we look, for example, for um, oh, yeah, so by default, sure, we would have a terms aggregation for the ingredients, and so now if we are um, there's a bug in the UI, sorry, I need to reload. I search for chicken. And I see the ingredients that are selected there. Well, pepper, salt, oil. Hey, that's actually not very useful. And the reason why it's putting those is that, um, well, yes, salt and oil and garlic and onion are, I mean, they're pretty much in, in, all, recip in all chicken recipes, but they're in all recipes, whether there's chicken or not. And if I take a look at roasts, then I also have oil, salt, pepper, and garlic. So th this is actually, yes, it, these are the most popular ingredients, the most common ingredients, but they're not necessarily relevant ones. And for this, this is why it's, uh, there's this significant term segregations that will look for this specific data set that matches the query. What is more significant? So what happens more often for that data set than for the entire da database. Um, and so if we look at these significant terms um, and I put chicken, uh, then I will have, well, chicken, of course, but also skinless, boneless, boneless breasts, broth, all things which are actually very relevant to chicken. Um, or if I put vanilla, um, then I will have things that are specifically used in conjunction with vanilla. So this is a very nice way to have very relevant uh, terms. Um, this is this is also something that's that's great for 
like anytime you have something like for popularity um significant terms it's it just like gives you very nice insights into your data sets and this is also something that you can use here um in um in your in kibana if we create a new maybe a new table um where we first take the terms uh, the sources So we have a look at our top maybe 10 sources. And then for each source, we will figure out what our um, specific um, uh, significant terms for ingredients, maybe just one. And, oh. Pounds, white. Uh, okay, this is not particularly. Uh, <laughs> this is not particularly a good one. Uh, I, I filter out some of those, and and somehow there's there's still more. But um, actually, it it what's interesting, like all these recipes are in English, um, but most of them are American, and we see that some of the <laughs> some of the, the the European ones, like use grams a lot more than. <laughs> Than uh, the other one, so it's it still still gives us uh, some some insightful uh, data, uh, well some uh, insightful, uh, yeah stuff, but um, yeah, uh, but the, 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 this is like uh, Kibana is actually a great way to play around and, and kind of <laughs> see hey what what kind of data do I have there, um, so this is yeah, this is great fun. And also, one of the things that um, that kind of is expected in a modern search interface, uh, just like like five or ten years ago, uh, people were really excited about facets, and now it's kind of an expected UI pattern. And like it's part of the search interface, especially when you have large amounts of data. Um, then you uh, you will also um, want to date to have. Uh, an autocomplete. And we can also do that with Elasticsearch quite easily. Um, here uh, we are going to cheat again and it's going to be actually very similar to what we did for the search that we're going to, to um, do a search and return some, um, some facets. Uh, but only the facets that start with the inputs that we gave it. So this is very naive implementation of that, um, but uh, it actually works quite well. And so we will look at what are the ingredients that start uh, the, in, in our terms that start with whatever the, we typed in. And so now we have bacon, oh, bacon, bacon. That's a good one. Um, or chocolate and actually it's it's all happening fast enough that it it makes for a pleasant user experience um, you can speed that up a little bit by not doing a, a real Drupal bootstrap um, and just having a PHP file you don't save that much time though um, so that this is actually a, a separate uh, function on the controller, separate route to suggest in there. Um, so what we're doing here is we're specif specifying size zero. So we don't actually care about the results. We the search results. The only thing we care about are the uh, the aggregations. And there's um, Elasticsearch actually has some more. Um, some more advanced uh, autocomplete stuff that is really, really fast. But in my, well, it's always a compromise between how fast is it and how um, how much fun how many features, how, how much functionality you have. And these really fast things actually do a few compromises about like what data do you filter out and so on. And if you're dealing with a small data set and actually a couple hundred thousand of I, uh, items. This is a small data set. Like we we have, uh, we're using a Elasticsearch with a, an index that has like something like 13, 14 million entries. 
uh, and it still works quite well on, a, on just a single node. Um, so it's it, it's not serving like it's for a website. It's for internal a a analytics stuff. Um, but you can really do a lot. Uh, so in my experience, if you're indexing data from a Drupal site, you're probably not going to have that much content. And so it's not worth l looking at these like more complicated or more like uh, advanced uh, autocomplete uh, solutions uh, because you don't have that much data and you don't need, it's not going to make a difference. And as long as you're serving everything through Drupal, uh, one millisecond more or less is not going to make a difference because I think, well, if we take a look at the, the response times, um, oh, uh, no, it stops working. Oh, yeah. So we see, yeah, 174 milliseconds. Um, so it's, in a, in a real productive setup, it would be less than that for Drupal. But um, yeah, what we see here is actually Elasticsearch is taking maybe like two or three milliseconds to respond, and everything else is network latency, Drupal bootstrap, and all of that. Um, yeah, and we have one minute. Oh, no. Um, there's um, there's one, well I, I will still take one one minute uh, for this, so I I'm I'm sorry for like the the issues that we had at first and then how things were a little bit rushed at the end, but I think that um, I hope that you've seen that yeah actually this Elasticsearch API um, is actually quite nice um, if you have like. Hmm? I got another half hour. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, but um, yes, so w what we see is that uh, this Elasticsearch API is actually really nice to use, object-oriented. It uh, it's, it's great, it's well-documented, uh, and it's very nice to work with. And what we've seen is that in a lot of projects, um, we, and, and especially Drupal 8 projects, we are not using... Uh, the search API, so the, the traditional Drupal way of integrating uh, external search systems uh, into Drupal. Uh, and the reason is that we want to use all the advanced functionality. We, need, we want to specify how our text is going to be parsed. Uh, we also want to specify sometimes, well, we have multilingual sites, you want to have Chinese text that's parsed with Chinese recognition and English text that parsed with English recognition. Um, and that actually makes a huge difference. Um, and, and also, we want to have some more advanced features, like, for example, Elasticsearch has this percolator, uh, which is an inverse search. Look it up. It's really cool. Uh, this is the way uh, that you can do saved searches. For example, we're building a, an a uh, real estate website at the moment that has a lot of data and people need want to say, well, I'm looking for a five-bedroom apartment that will cost between 15 and 200, uh, 1,500 and 2,000 euros uh, that's like in this neighborhood. Um, and, um, and this way, like whenever a new entry is posted, this reverse search, instead of just on Cron just executing all the searches, uh, there's this reverse search that when something new is posted, we say, hey, is there any search that matches for, for which this new entry would be a result? And then we can send out um, notifications based on that. So there's some really amazing stuff that you can do with Elasticsearch that, well, the search API just didn't plan for. Because when it was created, it was like, hey, let's build a more flexible alternative to Apache Solar. Um, but Apache Solar is actually, it, it's great, but it's, it's not exactly uh, trending anymore. It's still in use, uh, but it's kind of like Drupal 6. It's still in use, but uh, nobody's uh, switching from Elasticsearch to Solar. Um, so that's, um, 
yeah, what, what, what we see is that it's very easy to write custom code that uses Elasticsearch. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to start from scratch every single time. There are certain things like how do you put entities, uh, how do you index your entities into Elasticsearch, how do you do all of that uh, helper functions to, to drop the index, to recreate it. Um, these are all things that, um, yeah, they... Um, the, the, you should not have to write this on every project. And what we did is based on experience with a few different projects um, is uh, we created a module called Elasticsearch Helper. Um, and what this module actually does is it pr defines a plugin, a Drupal plugin type um, that you can then implement. And actually it's already installed on your local installation. Um, and I'm just going to switch to um, stash. Um, get the checkout uh, solutions. Okay, so now I have the latest version, and now I have uh, in my plugins uh, folder I have an Elasticsearch index, and this is a plugin for my Elasticsearch helper. It doesn't need to override anything, it just needs to extend the um, Elasticsearch index base. And there, in the annotation, we specify what it's called, uh, what is name of the index, what is name of the type, what entity type do we want to index. This is optional, uh, but if we specify one, then the data would automatically get indexed. And then we also specify what bundle we want to put in there. And now if we go here and we create a new index, uh, a new recipe, and we can put, well, let's stay on topic, bacon, bacon, bacon. Um, <coughs> we now have a, a new node that we're indexing. And what it's doing, um, it's actually putting it in an index called Drupal recipes. And, oh, I don't want to see the mapping, I want to see the search. And there we have it. So we're putting data, um, just by defining this, we're putting data uh, in Elasticsearch. Um, you might be wondering where <laughs> does the structure come from? Um, the structure is actually coming from a normalizer. So this is all using standard Drupal 8 APIs, the same one that you use for if you want to override how uh, your your data is exported in REST services. Here we specify for the Elasticsearch helper format, uh, we want to structure things this way. Um, and yeah, there we have it. And what we can do in our controller, we can say, well, we want to search on um, <coughs> Drupal recipes and recipes. Um, and so now we go back to the home page. Bacon. Okay. Um, why is it? And so now we should be seeing this in the list. And the reason why we're not seeing it, and I, I was trying to debug this last night, uh, I realized, well, by default, uh, Elasticsearch returns 10 uh, facets or 10 aggregations. Uh, we have 10 and ours is not on the list. So we're going to modify this um, that we actually want here. Um, size. We're going to put like 100, something like that. That's big enough, arbitrary big number. Um, uh, or, uh, um, and now we see uh, we have more and should be somewhere here. Drupal. Okay, 
demo effect. Um, but I, I can guarantee, oh, because I'm, I modified the code in the wrong place. And now, yeah, and we have our, our recipe from Drupal that is actually mixed with external data. In like a realistic situation, you would probably want to like import all your data using migrate into Drupal and then index everything this way. There's there are different use cases, and sometimes you have. I mean, we, we have some use cases where we're in importing a really huge amount of data uh, from external sources, and uh, we don't we don't want to save everything as an entity. So we bypass the entities uh, completely. We just save the, the data into Elasticsearch. Uh, sometimes you want to have the entities and index those entities. Uh, so yeah, you can do a lot of uh, combine things in a lot of different ways. Um, it requires programming. Yes, that's true. Um, so this is not like search API where you can say, I want to index this, I know I want to create a view. Um, but what we see is that usually for a lot of projects, um, we want like the search interfaces really need to be customized to the business logic of the project. Um, there's no like one size fits all approach that will actually give good results. Uh, and so if you're if you, the search the, on your site is critical to your to the business, um, then I think it makes sense to invest time. And so that means putting time into how the data gets into Elasticsearch and how it gets indexed, and then uh, having some nice interface um, to display that data, and use, usually using a front-end app that's Angular-based or something like that actually gives you uh, the kind of user experience that, um, that the user ex are expecting today. <clears throat> um, um. Uh, looked into things like uh, on Apple.com, when you search for MacBook, for example, it gives you two sets of results. Yep. It gives you results on shop, online, uh, CMS results, which was a bit So you have two different data sets, and it offers you all the data shop if you want to read the data. Yeah, so the, 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 that's a. Um, a good example. I actually, so what I'm doing here for the autocomplete, that's a very basic one, um, but the autocomplete is actually going to vary a lot based on what you're doing. For example, we have an, we built an intranet uh, where if you type a user's name, then you want like to just have an, a, a result directly in there as like, hey, you want to, like John Smith? Yes, that's this person. And when you select this entry, instead of searching for it, it just redirects you to your profile. So uh, th this kind of like this kind of inter interaction is possible. And what you're talking about, where say you want to you have two different sections in the autocomplete, this is actually um, the way that you would do this is that with aggregations you can uh, like you can put them one under the other. So you can say, well, I want first for uh, aggregate by source, and then under source I want to know what are the top recipes. Uh, or what are going to be the ingredients, or whatever. Um, and, and so this would actually give you, I mean, the same thing like that, that you get on, on Amazon, uh, where you search for a specific product, and it suggests the category for you automatically. Um, so you can actually get some very nice, uh, nice stuff working like that. We've done this on a couple of projects, um, and I think Generally, when working with with these kind of interfaces, you need to try it out because it's very difficult to just like create a design mockup and say, "Well, this is what the data that we're going to get, and we're going to display it like that." No, you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, so make sure that you have real data. When you have real data, try it out, and then you will see what comes out of that, and then you can adapt the design to that. Um, so this is a general tip: don't don't design your interface before you know what data you get based on your data set. So if you yeah. have two different data sets, like you have information from the shop and information from the CMS, you do it like you just said, you have two 
subcategories? Yeah, or you could also uh, you could do two separate queries that could okay. also work. I mean, if you're serving it through Drupal, it's not going to make a difference in terms of response time. Um, and if you want to optimize that, there's even an API that lets you do multiple queries in one request. Um, Any any other questions? Can you explain a little bit more what was the significant terms part because uh, I missed this one? Yeah. So the the terms well I I think the the significant terms is modification on the standard term segregation. Um maybe look with a, a good example. Um you um, we actually had this for a, an intranet where we wanted to show what are like pop, what is popular uh, this week and if you take just like if you aggregate by well what has been viewed the most um, and aggregate that by by page then you will always get for most intranets the menu of the cafeteria always every week and, and so if you just look for the most popular thing, then it's, I mean, just like for recipes, you get salt. Every recipe has salt. Um, that's, and sorting by like recipes that have salt, it gives you absolutely nothing. Um, so you don't only want to have the most popular terms, but you want to have the terms that are particularly popular for that query that are less popular elsewhere. So it's it's kind of like looking at the the the, the, the ratio. There is does uh, automatically does it like the elastic search? It marks some of the terms that are more significant than the others. Yeah. So it's it's all based on on statistics. Okay. Um, and so the, what we have here, for example, uh, with bacon, um, smoked bacon, streaky bacon, lardens. Um, these are terms that come more often in combination with bacon than with other terms. So it, it's not that they only come in in this combination, but they're the the it, It's kind of a correlation indicator. And how are these so sorted now? Um, at the moment, they're sorted by um, how many results there are. So if I select yeah, streaky, the like then uh, is, uh, yeah, that's a good. And uh, it's paper like it's two thousand nine hundred and twenty-four. Yeah. So I actually, uh, yeah, pepper. It's actually there's a lot of results, but it's not that there's not not such a high correlation. I wonder <coughs> what was the default sorting criteria. So I, I think in, in this case, it's kind of a, a and I, I'm not sure it makes sense to, to show the numbers there um, yeah. in this case, uh, but it's it's kind of like the, the correlation. So yes, there's a lot of stuff for pepper, but pepper is actually quite common. Still happens more often in combination with bacon than other things, but it's, um, it's quite generic. Whereas rashers, I actually don't know the term, but I guess it's <laughs> or or streaky bacon. I definitely know that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like slice of bacon, and it's like you don't use that term for anything else but bacon. So this this one is actually a very good uh, indicator because it only happens for bacon, but it's there's even though there's not that much. So it, it's it's really the I, I guess it's sorted by correlation. And so, it says rasher only occurs with bacon. Does that, does that have some yeah. more relevance? Yeah. So the, 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 this uh, this significant terms is actually um, it gives you correlation. I understand. I, yeah. I don't know if you use the Angular for the rendering and, and mm -hmm. for the rendering part, but how did you add the 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 results for ingredient like that number? Um, so if um, it's like uh, how many uh, how many recipes the ingredients are in the results set? Yeah. 
Yeah. So if the 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 way that I'm doing that is that I'm returning the hits, so the results, and then for the ingredients facet, I I have I'm I'm actually passing on the data the same structure that I have from Elasticsearch. Usually you don't want like you want to make sure that you only return things that that is relevant for your front end application. Um, so the the I actually the, this is a common question like people say hey Elasticsearch it's a REST API HTTP based can can't we just talk to it directly from from the front end? It's like the answer is like yes you can but don't do it. The reason is that well you can do um, X, just do a delete request to uh, and um, oh since everything uh, can happen from uh, from uh, an HTTP request, you can just just drop your index like that. Um, or you can, yeah. Or you can put stuff in the index. Or you can, if you have scripting enabled, you can execute scripts, which is why scripting is not enabled by default. Um, so there's, um, yeah. You definitely want to make sure that the API that, you, like, that you provide to the outside from Drupal is limited to what you want to enable in your app, and then between Drupal and Elasticsearch, you have the full, uh, the full Elasticsearch API. And yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's it, it depends. Um, one of the like with this implementation, for example, uh, the results don't get the dedicated pages. A dedicated page for so for SEO that's not that good, um, so you probably want to have to make sure that it's at least it gets its own route that gets indexed uh, separately by by Google. Um, so there's there's different. I mean, if you're building an internet, for example, this it doesn't matter. Um, if you're, yeah. so there's there's different considerations to be to be taken there, um, and actually, if you want to just uh, do your Elasticsearch request in a controller and just build uh, like an HTML page out of that. That works well too. There, there's we actually do that on a few projects, and yeah, that that also works so very the well. Of the controller is, uh, just an HTML. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> or you can just have a normal Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So how, however you want to to generate that. Um, yeah. Oh, and there's one thing that I should mention here re regarding this uh, Elasticsearch helper. One of the things that that we want to be able to do, we want to be able to override how specific things are happening. So, for example, we had one project that was Chinese and Korean and Japanese, and all of these need different analyzers. Um, and the way that we did it is that we created separate indices, one per language, and um, so you, you sometimes need to do specific things that are very like uh, specific to your project. And instead of having some kind of alter hook, what we have in this case, we have the base plugin, and we can just override how things are done. For example, when we do the setup, we can just override the setup function. Um, the default doesn't do anything because you can just send data to Elasticsearch, but you can there. Um, just set up your indices and so create and there you can just put whatever you we had in our custom code so it, this this elastic search helper module actually makes it very easy to to put all the things related to your index in one place um, and and it's still nicely encapsulated works with entities and, and all of that uh, without having fully custom code like we what we used and in this workshop Hmm? 
Uh, no. No, the, so they're, they're sorted by how significant they are. So that's, yeah. But actually, if you want to sort them alphabetically, you can. Uh, or you can, yeah. So there, for all the all these facets, you can specify the, the sorting order. Um, yeah. Yes? The MOU also is Angular in the example. Yeah. Because Angular is kind of last year with the, the new, new page on the block. Uh, um, we, we actually used it. Uh, we have a project that uses Riot. Um, so a kind of lightweight React. Um, so although that's kind of like February 2016, I'm not sure what's, uh, what's <laughs> current. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's actually, the, the approach is pretty much the same. Um, there's no no major differences there, um, although I mean that, that's kind of outside of the scope of Elasticsearch. But I think uh, Angular, yes, it's it's not cutting edge, uh, but it is good. It is like big mammoth, a little bit like Drupal, and so actually it works well in combination be with Drupal because it's it's an opinionated framework that says it comes with everything. If you want to do something, this is the way of doing it, which is like Drupal. So uh, with more cutting edge libraries, you need to you need to pick a router, you need to pick your thing, you need to t pick a templating thing, and, and and so you end up with like very customized solution that might be very well optimized, but it's a very different way of working than what Drupal developers are used to usually. And. Yes. If if you want to uh, to look at um, to play around with Elasticsearch, uh, one of the things that I've been looking for uh, for a long time um, it was just like data sets to play with. And the problem is that um, yeah, most data sets are kind of like one dimensional. For example, there's there's great examples of uh, ex exports of uh, Amazon reviews uh, that say hey was great, five star, and yeah, didn't like it so much. And uh, you, you can you can do interesting stuff with that, but it's all kind of one dimensional. Um, and uh, the, actually, this Open Recipes database, um, and actually you can. This is with the place where I got it from, um, and it tells a little bit more about the history and all and all of that. Uh, this is actually uh, you can do some very fun stuff with that. Um, and yeah, there, there's a few, uh, there's also an open ingredients, oh, oh, uh, open foods, uh, open food uh, facts. Uh, yeah, this is the, where it has also uh, quite a big uh, data set uh, with different products from different places and where it's from, how much it costs, what ingredients are in it, like food facts. Uh, this is actually a, a really fun one, but data is kind of inconsistent. Uh, it comes from different places, crowdfunded, uh, so I didn't want to use it today because it's 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 a little bit um, more difficult to work with. It's but it's, the, it is in, multi, in multiple languages, um, so it, it would have made things quite interesting, but also a little bit less intuitive. Uh, but if you want to play around with this, uh, and this actually comes in a, in a JSON file, I think, or both JSON and CSV file. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So this, yeah. So a typical example would be like. Um, well, if you go to Amazon, if you're buying no. monitors, it will have like a facet for sizes, no, and then another one will have gigabytes, which is not relevant for a monitor. Um, there's there's different approaches to that. I, I think it's it kind of depends. Um, I, I I'm not sure. I, I I wouldn't have like a generic way of doing that. But what you can do is 
you can see well how many well when when you do um, a, a, f a facet you can say I only want to return um, all like I only want to return facet that deliver at least this many uh, this many results so if anything that has only like 10 or less you don't care about it and so when you do that um, you can say well I have 15,000 results and I want to make sure that I only display facets that will have at least 50% that will be relevant to 50% of the, the results. And you can parse through all the facets and check which ones are the... Actually, you can specify that. Oh. So, um, so the, the, this is one of the, the parameters. Um, so you can, th this way you can say, hey, um, if it doesn't have at least 10,000 results, don't display that facet. And then when you drill down, if you have 200 results, you say, if it doesn't at least have uh, 50 results, then don't display it. Um, so if you want to um, use Elasticsearch, uh, this data set helps, your demo helps, this one helps to then read the book, or what's the best way to kind of get into using it? Um, I think, well, so if, if you go to um, Elasticsearch, there's, um, there's the reference, and then... Um, So there, there's two parts in the Elasticsearch documentation. There's the reference that really tells you this API has these parameters. Uh, oh. Yeah. And then there's um, the, the guide, which is more of a narrative. It says, well, this is how you would do this kind of things. Um, and this is actually a, a very, it, it's sometimes kind of fun to just read through that. Uh, it has some good getting started information um, and, and things like that. And then about like searching, tells you how search uh, is, is done and, and so on. It also gives you some insights. We didn't really cover this um, today and like the, how it works in the distributed setup, how it does the sharding. This is one of the great advantages like of Elasticsearch in, in production uh, and DevOps actually love this. Uh, you just say, hey, I want a node and another node and another node and just talk to each other and it will automatically just replicate the data. Um, so this is this is really uh, very nice to work with, very easy to set up a, a high availability setup. Um, yeah. And actually, um, this, um, this, uh, this guide, I have a printed version here. And uh, the guys at Elastic uh, were nice enough to send us a couple of copies to give away. This is even, um, well, it's the early release, uh, um, but it's, there's been many releases before. So I think most of this should be correct. <laughs> Um, and it comes with uh, sign signed by Shai Bannon, the author, the creator of Elasticsearch. Um, so this is collectible. Um, might be worth a lot of money. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, so um, yeah, I have a few of those. Um, anybody interested? Yeah. Oh, okay. So a lot of people. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't have that many. We have couple. Um, anybody has something to fix in the slides that I, or, or the slide, the, the code that I have? Any suggestion for improvements? Hmm? Any instructions for the wrong in the code banner? I fixed that. Hmm? I, I, I fixed that last night. But did you push I did push it. You read the other page. Five six zero zero. Thank you. You get a book. Yes. <laughs> okay. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> And make sure you tweet about it. I think it's it's great that they're they're uh, they're sponsoring this kind of events. 
and uh, yeah. And we also have a lot of stickers if you want something cool to add uh, to put on your laptop. Elasticsearch stickers, Kibana stickers. There's also a couple log stash stickers. I think Elastic Cloud. Cool stuff. Xpac. Things worth looking into. Um, really cool stuff. So come here and grab some. And um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm still not sure what to do with that last one. Any suggestions? <laughs> Give it away. Give it away. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It, it will be given away. And, uh, <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you.